Hi, I'm Rick Dior. Today I'm going to start a video series on basic hand technique. Now this is a long time coming on this channel. Normally I deal with advanced topics and I've already done many many videos, probably almost a hundred on advanced hand technique, but we're going to go back and start this series, like I said, on a step-by-step basic approach to correct, what I consider correct, hand technique. I was very, very lucky when I was uh, a young guy to be able to study with some of the greatest uh, drummers uh, ever in New York City and around that area, and they had all had amazing technique. And I'd go into clubs and watch them play and just kind of copy what they did. And then if I didn't understand something, I'd go and take a lesson. So uh, that's what my technique is based on. It's more of a traditional uh, not necessarily traditional grip, because I play both grips, as most of you watch this channel know, but more of a traditional approach to hand technique that goes really, really far back, uh, at least to the 1930s and 40s. So we'll be talking about that. I will be using a metronome for some things. I promise not to play anything too fast. And let's just go over the equipment that I'm going to be using, because I know I'll get questions on that. I'll be using a practice pad, and this is a very old, quiet tone. You see, I got a little towel tucked in, in here so it doesn't ring too much. Uh, this was originally invented by Henry Adler in the 1960s. Uh, this one is probably from the 1980s or so. It still works just fine. And then I have a snare drum here. You probably can't see it on this camera view. It's a Ludwig concert drum. I won't be using that much in this first video. And then a pad over that so again it doesn't rattle too much. So that's the equipment I'm going to be using for this whole entire series. Now I'm making these videos for uh, a lot of my students uh, who are adults and they come to me wanting to the re refine their technique. Uh, it's not necessarily a, a young kid who's a beginner, but it can definitely be geared towards that if, you, if some of you teachers want to share this with them. Also, I teach a course at the university for uh, music educators. Uh, they have to you know, teach in the schools and they'll be teaching technique. So it's really important to get that uh, through to them clearly. So for this first video, we'll be dealing with the traditional grip. Uh, you can go back and watch some of my other videos. I have a hand technique playlist that's got many, many videos on there. The difference between that and this one will be I have lots of cameras set up, five cameras. So you'll be able to look at different angles. I'll put all these on the screen for you so you can see them. And I will be, you know, more of a slower, be at a slower pace here for you. So we'll start right at the beginning, and I'll talk to you about my concept. And a lot of this is from my own teaching, not necessarily something that I learned or was explained to me by my own teachers, but it's, you know, uh, something that I kind of came up with over many years. So as um, humans, as we are, we're tool users, right? So we'll use um, a, you know, some sort of tool to hit something or build something or, you know, whatever we're going to do with that tool. And so our instinct is to use our whole arm like that. The instinct is not to do this or definitely not this. All right, so that does not come naturally to us, that finger kind of technique. Uh, that is the principal technique for playing, you know, great drumming for having a great sound for being able to play things quickly and cleanly so you have to learn that for most people that doesn't come naturally so that finger technique that kind of bounce <laughs> technique uh, you know you're not born with that necessarily you have to learn it so uh, if you play traditional grip that left hand grip is probably the weirdest thing you'll ever do in your life and it's very difficult to teach and it's not really taught that much anymore but when i was growing up uh, and learning in the uh, early 70s 1970s that is uh, the uh, the grip uh, was being taught all the time you rarely would learn match grip unless you were playing uh, timpani or the mallet instruments so the traditional grip was always taught first and I didn't actually even get on a drum set till I'd been playing for about five years. I started playing very, very young, I believe when I was about eight years old. And then I got my first drum set when, you know, I was about uh, maybe almost 13 years old. And I started gigging pr pretty much immediately. Now, I'd play drum set in school, but, um, you know, in, in middle school and stuff like that. But I didn't have my own to practice on. So... All that time before that, I just worked on a snare drum and a pad 
uh, with my hands and I'm so glad I did that because it really enabled me once I got a drum set to be able to pretty much do anything I needed to do with my hands and my feet followed quickly behind that so that traditional grip is the hardest thing to teach and you don't have to teach it but I recommend teaching it because it does work for a lot of things in drumming including playing brushes uh, if there's any kind of rudimental drumming I believe it has a lot of advantages I've said this in videos before where if you're playing traditional grip I believe it takes advantage of the weak hand so there's not so much hand and fingers on that stick so it lets that stick move because it is your non-dominant hand so we'll start with that and the first thing I teach with traditional grip is basically the grip itself and we have this little pocket here all right between my thumb and my first finger and the stick goes in there and you're gonna go about a third of the way up the stick depending on the stick and that's called the balance point so the balance point is where the stick bounces the, the easiest so and the longest without anything moving it and there I'm not using any fingers everything's off the stick that's how you find your balance point if I move up here on the stick not a lot of bounce if I move back not a lot of bounce but if I move more like a third of the way up the stick I get the most bounce so that's really really important as a first step to teach where to hold the stick now these particular sticks I'm using because I forgot to talk about that uh, these are uh, sticks that I make they're a uh, uh, leopard wood they're about 73 grams 72 grams somewhere around there and this is my general concert stick but when I'm practicing and I've talked about this before in other videos I do use a heavy stick not thick but heavy these are made of coca bolo which is a heavy wood and these will get lots of bounce so you see right away how much more that bounces than a lighter stick so I call this a training stick the next thing I'll teach uh, after that balance point is the actual grip itself because when you bounce it there's nothing gripping the stick so your thumb needs to touch this first finger it's not any kind of death grip or tight or anything but it's in contact there's a lot of bad habits I'm going to talk about today the first one is what I call hitchhiker thumb where the thumb is up I see lots and lots of players playing this way it's not a good idea to do that so they're playing like this uh, as you'll see in a minute that keeps the thumb off the stick and then you can't use it so that's a bad habit number one and you want to touch that first finger with your thumb very very lightly so that thumb is is downwards not upwards okay and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna do this with our hands like a karate chop put the stick in there and just let that forearm move Again, the thumb is not up like this, it's down like that. And just, you know, you can put on the metronome. I'd say a good tempo is about 60 to start with, and you're going to want to put on the 16th note. Try to make that metronome disappear, okay, right on it, evenness. And, you know, it's going to feel a little weird at first, but that builds up your forearm strength and your wrist, all right? The next step is to just use that thumb, and we'll go a little faster here at quarter note equals 70. Now it's really important here to keep your fingers together don't splay them out and put the thumb over the stick the next step is to turn your hand over and this is the trickiest part and try to use your fingers and it's the first two fingers now we'll spend a little time explaining this because um, I know in my other videos I might not have been real clear about it but what happens is the fingers go over the stick the thumb basically stays on the side here and you're gonna move the fingers like this these bottom two fingers which we'll talk about in a minute are gonna just be tucked in like that okay 
it's going to feel really weird. It's like doing that Star Trek thing, you know, where you have to spread out your fingers like that, you know, the Vulcan thing. All right, I think that's Vulcan. It's hard to do with your left hand, so try it. So normally our non-dominant hand will not be able to do those kinds of coordination things as easy. And with the traditional grip, that's what happens. So if we put that over and we put it on 70, All right, and this is actually harder to do slower than it is fast. It's pretty easy to do fast, but control is what you want. So just remember, these two fingers, the bottom two, get tucked in. The top are straight. They're not like this, so not like this. They're straight, like this, see? And they're both touching the stick. Uh, when I marched drum corps when I, was a, when I was a kid, we used to do this thing where we'd alternate you know, little tricks and stuff like that. Don't do that. <laughs> Just keep them together for now. But they both touch the stick, okay? So uh, that's very, very important. I see lots of people playing really weird and wrong traditional grip, and then they wonder why they can't play even doubles. And singles. because they're not using their fingers in the best ergonomically uh, way possible, all right? So let's review. First we have the karate chop, and that's for the forearm and the wrist. Then we have the thumb, so fingers straight out, all right, not splayed, and the thumb goes over the stick and you're just exercising that. And then we have the overhand finger technique where we're putting the bottom two fingers against my palm as much as possible. And the thumb is basically just sitting there doing nothing. And these you're exercising the top two fingers. And then we're going to put it all together. And when we do our left hand grip, the, the angle of the snare drum is going to be just a little bit tilted towards your right, just a hair. You can even play flat if you want, just higher. But I don't do this big tilt or anything like that. It just goes along with the axis of my hand. So you see there how that works. So when we put it all together and we're just doing basic you know, 16th notes. That's what I call the everything stroke, all right? So in this case, I'm using a little bit of wrist, a little bit of thumb, and a little bit of fingers. But what's important is the ratio of what you're using. So certain kinds of strokes or uh, stickings, or you might want to call them rudiments or whatever, are going to use different ratios. So sometimes it's more finger heavy, sometimes it's more wrist heavy, all right, sometimes it's more bounce heavy. So those are the big things. You can use your fingers. You can use your wrist, which is going to be slower, and then you can use bounce. And then all those things come together to create great technique in the traditional vein. And of course, obviously, match grip. It's the same idea, you're just copying that right hand with your left hand. And I've done, uh, recently, a couple videos on the match grip. You might want to search just for match grip, you'll find them. So we're not going to go over that too much. But most all the questions I get are on traditional grip. Uh, so that's what the focus of this first uh, lesson is on. So those strokes, the fingers, the thumb too, which includes the fingers, obviously, the wrist, and the bounce stroke, I'm going to show you how they work. So let's take a, a paradiddle, a single paradiddle. Everybody knows those, all right? So that's right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left. If you don't know that sticking, you need to know it because it's sort of one of the most important stickings you ever learned as a drummer. And they can range from really slow to really fast.
All right, and you need to be able to play them both ways, obviously. Now, as you get faster with the paradiddle, different things happen. So when I play a slow paradiddle, I'm relying pretty much on height and bounce. So, and here I'm accenting the first note. You don't have to do that. But traditionally, that's the way it's done. So when I rely on that bounce stroke, the first stroke is higher, and I'm, that's my weight. So if I ghost on my, left, on my left knee here or leg, this is what it sounds like. So you see that motion. And that first stroke carries through to the bounce. What you don't want to do is this. That's pretty much as fast as you're going to be able to get it. If you bounce, you can get it as fast as you want. Almost a roll, really, uh, doing that. So that bounce stroke is really important. So that works into most all of your stickings, except for maybe just a few that are real wrist dependent. So the ratio of a paradiddle, in other words, would be, I would say, about 60% bounce, all right, and about pretty much 20% fingers, and then 20% wrist. And the wrist really only activating on that first stroke. Everything else, especially the second two strokes, is a bounce. Okay, so that's, that's what I mean by ratio. And every sticking, this is when I teach my students privately, this is what we talk about. Every kind of sticking, every kind of stroke has a ratio of bounce, to wrist. Now I never use my arms. When you're doing the Muller technique or then you're using your shoulder in a whip stroke. We're going to cover that in a separate video. I've already done a video on it but we're going to get more into it in another video. But that particular stroke that Muller stroke does not use a straight up and down motion. It's a sideways motion. Kind of like a pitch if you pitch, or they call it a whip stroke. I don't know if any of you use a whip out there, but it's that kind of stroke where your arm or your elbow is coming in, in this case, like that. Okay, that creates velocity. But in this case, we're not doing any of that. We're just relying on height to create our bounce, and the bounce being the number one uh, important thing when you're doing these kinds of sticking set involved doubles. So let's take a look with the paradiddle of what my left hand's doing now. So if you watch this, There's all kinds of stuff going on there, right? So you see these bottom fingers, I call these the regulators, coming up as these other fingers are coming down. What the bottom two fingers do is they regulate the movement of the stick. If you're not using those, then your stick's just going to do this. And you're just going to sound really sloppy all the time. If you use your fingers and create sort of a trap here that the stick could move in between, then you can actually change the distance between those fingers to create dynamics and speed and different kinds of phrasing. So, so you see what I did there? When I'm playing louder, I'm opening up my hand more, but the fingers are still active and the stick is bouncing between them. I never remove my fingers from the stick like this. And I see an alarming number of players playing like that these days. It's, it's not good. So you want to keep those fingers always active. And these top fingers are moving down, but the most important finger now is the thumb. Because the thumb, if you remember correctly, creates that motion. And it's a powerful finger, your most powerful finger. Okay, so that motion, that downward motion is what you want. So if you watch the accent, you see that. Now that's called a clinch. So when you clinch a stick, you're doing that and it's like this. All right, so it's not violent, but it's powerful. 
So it takes a long, a long time to get that strength and power. So, you know, maybe a number of years, but you will get it if you work on it. Now, the best way to work on a clinch is with uh, a bounce clinch exercise. So if you take two bounce strokes and then you accent the last one, See, that's a clinch exercise. So you, you have to rely on your wrist snap and your fingers mostly. It's a little bit of wrist, but mostly fingers. So in this case, the ratio would be bounce first. So that's its own little thing. But then the ratio between wrist and fingers would be about 70% clinch and then 30% wrist. Because the wrist isn't doing a stroke like this. It's just moving like that, okay? So if you don't understand it, you could just start with two strokes like this. That's also the way that you would do a shuffle. Okay, if you need to do that with all the snare drum notes, which is a common groove that you'll have to play. So that clinch is really important. Now with the right hand, the clinch is pretty obvious, but all you do is drop it and then you push your fingers, you squeeze it. All right, that's how you do that. And again, I have uh, several videos on that match grip where I talk exactly about that, but not necessarily with the traditional grip. So those are the, the tools you're going to need to actually function, and this is going to take a while. So let's talk about how to build this up. The first way, like we talked about earlier, is just to do these exercises once again with the thumb and then the whole arm or the forearm and then the fingers over. That's just not going to happen in a day. You know, you got to be patient over a series of months maybe, or longer, however long it takes. But just the things to remember is straight up and down, not in circles. And then you turn it over, which is the tricky thing, all right? And keep these fingers as regulators, the bottoms and the tops. So you want to practice a series of rudiments. So let's quickly talk about rudiments. So all rudiments are, are stickings, and you need to learn as many different stickings as possible. So there's lots of books out. Of course, there's the classic Stick Control by George Lawrence Stone. I definitely recommend that, and Accents and Rebounds. There's Joe Morello's Master Studies books. Uh, I have a book called uh, uh, Let's Go Camping, which, which is a three camps book, which, which is most, the most redundant thing you've ever seen because you're taking all the stickings and just repeating them like in paradiddles. you know, in these patterns. So if you don't know a sticking after doing one of those, then you'll probably never know it. So I really believe in teaching like that because it's all about repetition and muscle memory. If you get these stickings in your muscle memory, they're not going to fail you. And I did a video recently on how I say, uh, you know, paradiddles like single, double, triple. So it'd be like single, double, double, single. So... And I'm thinking double, double, single. It's a phrasing thing that it's like shorthand for drumming, basically. And if you can do that, you can play some incredible things. And if you're playing with an orchestra or, um, you know, any, any kind of sight reading, it really helps with sight reading because it's so easy. You, you can never get, uh, you know, fouled up technically. It's just basically it's your mind at that point. And most sight reading mistakes happen because of bad technique or faulty technique where you're technique can't keep up with what you're processing and you just screw up. So it's a big part of that. If you're a professional musician, you will have to do a lot of gigs where you are sight reading and then that's why it is important. So those are the books I recommend for working on technique. And again, I have so many videos on that. If you look on my hand technique playlist, the next thing I like to work on, as most of you know, are these sort of rudimental classic books like Nard and the Wilcoxon books and the Pratt books and on and on. There's so many of them. Those are so fantastic. You're not going to sound like a marching band drummer or if, you might want to. This stuff is great. It's fun. But you're not necessarily going to sound like that when you play the drum kit. 
you can turn that off and just use the stickings. But it's so good for putting together these phrases and the way you're thinking and, uh, you know, pieces of music. It's like a language, really, is what it is, is every sticking is a word, and you're putting these words into sentences, which become paragraphs, and it's a statement. It's a musical statement. So if you want to be a coherent drummer when you solo or you play fills and all that, this is a must to learn. And it really is amazing to me at how many people come to me who've studied before from with several different teachers for a long time who've never done any of this. No hand technique. No, I'm going to try not to rant here, but no reading, no traditional kind of drumming. It's kind of almost getting lost, and I'm a little worried about that. So I always teach all my students to teach that to their students so we can keep the evolution of drumming greatness going. So that's it for this first video. I probably went a little longer because I talked too much. Uh, for this video, but in, in future videos in this series, we're going to talk about uh, the Muller technique. We're going to get back, revisit that, and I'm going to show you some different camera angle, angles like today. We're going to talk a little more about the match grip, and then we're going to talk about uh, all kinds of particular things like playing close rolls, flams, drags, any kind of grace note that you'll play. Uh, as always, please, uh, you can comment questions or you can email me. I get lots and lots of emails from, from all of you every day. I really enjoy that. And I'm happy to answer them. I try to answer them as fast as I can. Sometimes I get a little behind. And, um, you know, any questions, anything unclear, uh, please let me know. And we'll see you next time.